shale development may be the key to the U.S. remaining the sole superpower for the next two generations. Energy is one of the keys to global political power. The U.S. is in a great position with regard to energy. We have shale, we have gas, we have oil, and more importantly, we have competitive markets. Anyone can develop them. Around the world, our rivals are in much worse position. Everybody knows about Russia's problems, Venezuela's problems, but even China, thought to be an economic powerhouse, is far behind the United States. The U.S. is the number one producer of energy in the world, and China is now the number one importer. The reason for that is China doesn't allow competition. It doesn't allow private property rights. As a result, production of coal and crude oil are down, requiring more imports even if economic growth slows. So while U.S. gas production is soaring, Chinese gas imports are soaring. In 2008, at the height of the financial crisis, it seemed as if U.S. global power was fading away. Now we're much sought after as an ally, cooperation in energy, trade, U.S. energy production being shipped overseas. While the U.S. will remain committed to the Middle East, we don't need to be dependent anymore on Middle Eastern energy producers like Saudi Arabia and Iran. In contrast, China is now the largest importer for the Middle East, and it could become enmeshed in the same kind of problems in the Middle East that have plagued the United States for the last 40 years. Natural gas has been the ugly stepchild of our national energy debate. Never enjoying the political muscle of oil and coal, and never capturing the imagination like solar panels and wind farms. And to top it all off, it was in short supply. But that's changing. And now this stepchild is being touted as the hope of the future, the answer to our energy problems. What's brought about the change is there's a new unconventional process for extracting natural gas from shale, a dense rock formation two miles underground. And if you're sitting on top of it, you may become a new American phenomenon, a shalionaire. And yet, if the BP spill last summer taught us anything, it's that exploring for energy has safety risks. But as we first reported in November, that can get lost in all the excitement. We've discovered the equivalent of two Saudi Arabias of oil in the form of natural gas in the United States. Not one, but two. See, we have twice as much natural gas in this country, is that what you're saying, than they have oil in Saudi Arabia? I'm trying to very clearly say exactly that. Aubrey McClendon is the CEO of Chesapeake Energy, the largest independent gas producer in the country. He's on a mission to get us off foreign oil and dirty coal. Gas has nearly half the carbon emissions of coal and no mercury. But natural gas is still a fossil fuel. So is it perfect? No, the answer is it's, it's not perfect. But for the next 20 years, natural gas is probably our best bet. And the good news is we've got it, and we've got as much of it as anybody else in the world. Look at a map of shale formations across the country, and you'll see that there's production or exploration in over 30 states. It's an American energy renaissance. 10,000 wells will be drilled here in northwest Louisiana in some of the poorest communities in the country, where impoverished farmers are becoming overnight millionaires as they lease their land for drilling. Within a year, shale drilling generated almost $6 billion here in new household earnings. As the rest of the nation plunged into a recession, this place added over 57,000 local jobs. Is a million years worth of shale. People have known for a century that shale contained gas, but it was too difficult and pricey to extract. I can't believe there's anything in this rock. <laughs> well, it, it, it is doesn't so look like solid. I mean, we can, yeah, it's no, it's pretty pretty really solid. solid. But this is shale under a microscope. The dark spaces are where the gas is, and it's everywhere. Oh, here's a great one. For example, that's what's that... going on in the middle of this thing? Yes. The breakthrough in extraction happened when two existing technologies were combined. The first involved accessing the shale by drilling sideways underground. We're currently over two miles down. Two miles down? Two miles down. Okay. Now, later today, we'll turn the bit from vertical to horizontal along this path, and then we'll drill in our target zone for a mile down to the south. The other technology is hydraulic fracturing, or fracking, where millions of gallons of water mixed with sand and chemicals are pumped down the well at enormous pressure. We break the rock, we fracture the rock, and that stimulates the ability of the gas to flow into the wellbore, where we can flow it to the surface and sell it. In light of the BP oil spill in the Gulf, 
I asked Aubrey McClendon about the safety of fracking. What would happen if you go down to dig for shale and you have an explosion and you destroy a whole part of the country? It cannot happen, okay? It cannot happen. Why do you say that? Well, because we're not a mile underneath the, the surface of the ocean. And if something were to get away, and, and there are incidents where wells um, have loss of control, um, you, can go, you can go fix it. Geologists have known for years that substantial deposits of oil and natural gas are trapped in deep shale formations. These shale reservoirs were created tens of millions of years ago. Around the world today, with modern horizontal drilling techniques and hydraulic fracturing, the trapped oil and natural gas in these shale reservoirs is being safely and efficiently produced, gathered, and distributed to customers. Let's look at the drilling and completion process of a typical oil and natural gas well. Shale reservoirs are usually one mile or more below the surface, well below any underground source of drinking water, which is typically no more than 300 to 1,000 feet below the surface. Additionally, steel pipes, called casing, cemented in place, provide a multi-layered barrier to protect freshwater aquifers. During the past 60 years, the oil and gas industry has conducted fracture stimulations in over one million wells worldwide. The initial steps are the same as for any conventional well. A hole is drilled straight down using fresh water-based fluids, which cools the drill bit, carries the rock cuttings back to the surface, and stabilizes the wall of the well bore. Once the hole extends below the deepest freshwater aquifer, the drill pipe is removed and replaced with steel pipe, called surface casing. Next, cement is pumped down the casing. When it reaches the bottom, it is pumped down and then back up between the casing and the borehole wall, creating an impermeable additional protective barrier between the well bore and any freshwater sources. In some cases, depending on the geology of the area and the depth of the well, additional casing sections may be run and, like surface casing, are then cemented in place to ensure no movement of fluids or gas between those layers and the groundwater sources. What makes drilling for hydrocarbons in a shale formation unique is the necessity to drill horizontally. Vertical drilling continues to a depth called the kickoff point. This is where the well bore begins curving to become horizontal. One of the advantages of horizontal drilling is that it's possible to drill several wells from only one drilling pad, minimizing the impact to the surface environment. When the targeted distance is reached, the drill pipe is removed, and additional steel casing is inserted through the full length of the well bore. Once again, the casing is cemented in place. For some horizontal developments, new technology in the form of sliding sleeves and mechanical isolation devices replace cement in the creation of isolations along the well bore. Once the drilling is finished and the final casing has been installed, the drilling rig is removed and preparations are made for the next steps, well completion. The first step in completing a well is the creation of a connection between the final casing and the reservoir rock. This consists of lowering a specialized tool called a perforating gun, which is equipped with shaped explosive charges, down to the rock layer containing oil or natural gas. This perforating gun is then fired, which creates holes through the casing, cement, and into the target rock. These perforating holes connect the reservoir and the well bore. Since these perforations are only a few inches long and are performed more than a mile underground, the entire process is imperceptible on the surface. The perforation gun is then removed in preparation for the next step, hydraulic fracturing. The process consists of pumping a mixture of mostly water and sand, plus a few chemicals, under controlled conditions into deep underground reservoir formations. The chemicals are generally for lubrication, to keep bacteria from forming, and help carry the sand. These chemicals typically range in concentrations from 0.1 to 0.5% by volume and help to improve the performance of the stimulation. This stimulation fluid is sent to trucks that pump the fluid into the well bore and out through the perforations that were noted earlier. This process creates fractures in the oil and gas reservoir rock. The sand in the frac fluid remains in these fractures in the rock and keeps them open when the pump pressure is relieved. This allows the previously trapped oil or natural gas to flow to the well bore more easily. 
This initial stimulation segment is then isolated with a specially designed plug, and the perforating guns are used to perforate the next stage. This stage is then hydraulically fractured in the same manner. This process is repeated along the entire horizontal section of the well, which can extend several miles. Once the stimulation is complete, the isolation plugs are drilled out and production begins. Initially water, and then natural gas or oil, flows into the horizontal casing and up the well bore. In the course of initial production of the well, approximately 15 to 50 percent of the fracturing fluid is recovered. This fluid is either recycled to be used on other fracturing operations or safely disposed of according to government regulations. The whole process of developing a well typically takes from three to five months, a few weeks to prepare the site, four to six weeks to drill the well, and then one to three months of completion activities, which includes one to seven days of stimulation. But this three to five month investment can result in a well that will produce oil or natural gas for 20 to 40 years or more. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie for Reason TV. If you're like me, when you think about fracking, you think about the fracking song. What the frack is going on? We know this fracking going on. I think we need some facts to go with the light. And in documentaries like Gasland. Six states have documented over 1,000 incidents of groundwater contamination. Our water was good before they started drilling. And when they got done, it was bad. Now, when I don't know what to think about something related to the environment or to technology or to science in general, I do what I always do. I turn to Reason's longtime science correspondent, Ron Bailey. Ron, thanks for joining us. Delighted to be with you. What is fracking and what is the controversy about? Fracking is a technology that's been around for about 60 years. Basically, you're injecting into deep wells water under high pressure with sand to crack open rocks to release hydrocarbon molecules like oil and natural gas. What other chemicals are used in the fracking process? Well, there are a variety of chemicals. They're, they're used for basically corrosion resistance, to prevent bacteria from fouling the equipment and the pipes and so forth. And some of them are, uh, are hazardous. You wouldn't want to drink them. They're things like benzene, for example, or formaldehyde. Critics charge that fracking uh, releases gases that then bubble up and pollute water. Is that what's going on? So far, there are no examples where this has been found. No examples anywhere at this point. That's the good news. The bad news is, is that when you dig these wells, they need to have casing, piping, in order to conduct the molecules up, the natural gas or the oil. And if you don't do it right, then what will happen is that the gas could escape and get into people's drinking water. And this has happened. But this is what will happen even with conventional wells. It has nothing to do with the technology of hydrofracturing or fracking. It has everything to do with the fact that somebody created a well incompetently. Talk a little bit about that uh, process by which gas got into people's water wells and when they turn on their faucets they could light it on fire. Is that what's happening? That has happened in some cases. For example, famously in a little town called Dimmock, Pennsylvania, where an energy company called Cabot Energy had dug about 60 wells in a nine square mile area and they used uh, fracking technology in order to get the, the gas out of the ground. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was is that the casings, that is the lining of the wells, were defective. And this was determined by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. And because of these defective casings, natural gas escaped into people's well water. And that is a problem. And the companies now uh, had to pay the, the citizens whose wells have been harmed $4 million for that. A number of anti-fracking people point to the case of Sublette, Wyoming, where supposedly that's what happened. Again, it's not the technology of fracking that seems to have been the problem there. The uh, federal agencies that looked into the matter have concluded that the wells that were contaminated were contaminated essentially by trucks that brought in the substances, in this case benzene, when they were busy siphoning water out of the wells. I should also point out these wells were not drinking water wells, they were industrial wells. It's still bad that they were contaminated, but the technology or fracking did not cause it itself, but basically was mishandled surface water. Why is it becoming so controversial right now? It moved into a new area that is the East Coast, Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, and West Virginia. Because it was discovered there's something called the Marcellus Shale, a more populated area, an area 
uh, in rural areas where people have not had to put up with the production of oil and natural gas. They're just not used to it. So there was a it's kind of a NIMBY backlash to it. And uh, natural gas is also a relatively uh, clean fuel? The Department of Energy's National uh, Energy Technology Laboratory estimates that burning natural gas would produce about half the amount of greenhouse gases that burning coal does. So it really is perhaps a bridge fuel, if you will, to a lower carbon energy future. The New York State Attorney General recently filed a lawsuit claiming that federal agencies that allow fracking haven't really adequately studied the issues or the cost benefits or the particular harms of it. Is the New York uh, State Attorney General onto something here? I, I don't believe that he is, actually. We've been doing 100,000 of these wells a year for many, many years. The technology has been around for 60 years. Basically, the technology is safe, as far as we can tell. What more, how much more study is really required? What's the great potential of fracking? I mean, can we be doing, should we be doing more of it? And what's, what's the potential payoff versus the potential risk that we've talked about? The potential payoffs are enormous uh, to fracking. Basically, the natural gas supply for the United States will last 100 years at current usages. We could move in the direction of reducing greenhouse gases very cheaply using this technology to, to produce electricity. It's a great benefit indeed. Another thing that's happening is the technology is now being used, just now being adapted to oil production. And it is possible, there are new estimates out there, using that technology, we could essentially produce three million new barrels of oil a day by 2020. That's the size of the production of Kuwait. And that would be all onshore, would not be in the Gulf, and it would be a huge benefit to the economy again in those ways. So just how real is the connection between fracking and earthquakes? And if there is a real connection, what does that tell us about how we should regulate natural gas extraction going forward? Joining me now for more on this are two experts in the field, Dr. Tony Ingrafia, Dwight C. Baum, Professor of Engineering and Weiss Presidential Teaching Fellow at Cornell University, and Tyson Slocum, Director of Public Citizens Energy Program. And welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah, great to be here, Tom. Thank you, Tyson. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, uh, Dr. Ingrafia, uh, walk us through this. What appears to be causing these earthquakes? There are two distinct um, impacts uh, re resulting from fracking in shale for gas or oil uh, that are causing human-induced, or I should say industry-induced seismicity. One is a direct impact, fracking itself. That is the actual action of stimulating a gas or oil well in a shale formation has been confirmed as causing industry-induced seismicity. That's a direct result of fracking. It's not as well known. It's not as well studied. It hasn't happened in as many places yet. The indirect result, uh, the indirect impact, is the result of the production of large quantities of fluid waste from the fracking process. That fluid waste is transported to what are known as class two waste injection wells, like the one that you just mentioned in Colorado. And those large volumes of fluid are injected into these waste injection wells over a long period of time uh, at sufficient pressure uh, that they are in effect lubricating or changing the pressure profile on existing faults and causing what faults do when they slip, earthquakes. Yeah. Is, is this, uh, Dr. Ingrafia, if I could just define the, the difference between these in really, really simple terms. When, when you frack, you drill down into the shale formation, you, you inject liquids under pressure that crack it, but then you pull them back out and you pull out the gas that comes with it. So the pressure has been relieved, essentially. Um, uh, am I so far correct? Yes. Okay. But on the other hand, now you've got all this wastewater that came out with the gas or the oil or whatever it is you're fracking out, and you've got to get rid of this stuff, and you want to get rid of it in a way where it's not going to come back out again. You're just going to stash it and leave it. So when you drill the injection wells for the wastewater, you're pumping that stuff down under the water on, or down under the earth at enormous pressure and just leaving it there. Does that mean that the injection wells would be more likely to cause earthquakes than the fracking? Because you're not relieving the pressure, you're just increasing pressure and then leaving it there? Maybe, maybe not. That part of the science hasn't been uh, firmed up yet, but let me just point out that uh, there are limits, regulatory limits, uh, on the pressure that one can use to inject waste in an injection well. There is no limit 
on the pressure that one uses to frack a well. Huh. So there are two distinct mechanisms here. In the case of the injection well, you're injecting very large quantities, millions of gallons of waste, tens of millions of gallons of waste at moderate pressures at one point in one well. Remarkable. And if you're just unlucky enough to have that well intersect uh, a, uh, a fault that's ready to go, then you have what's happened in Colorado, in Arkansas, in Oklahoma, in Texas, Ohio, British Columbia, England. But on the other hand, fracking involves many, many wells with less volume of fluid in each well, even though you still have millions of gallons per well, but at much higher pressure in over very large regions. I see. So the, the science isn't quite done yet as yeah. to the, what we yeah, refer to as the risk. What's the probability of having uh, a moderate to severe uh, earthquake resulting from either the direct or indirect result of fracking? Right. You've got variables going 16 ways to Sunday. Tyson yeah. Slocum. Um, why is it that this is not, I, you know, I know Josh, uh, uh, I'm forgetting, Josh Fox came out with, you know, Gasland a couple of years ago. I mean, this has been kind of floating around the edge of the environmental movement and, uh, and people who are living in gas country, but it really hasn't, it's only starting, it seems, to get some traction at the national level in terms of, of press and publicity. Why is that? Well, I think first because a lot of the opposition to fracking has revolved more around issues of water contamination and water quality issues, air quality issues, and quality of life concerns around and, fracking. And NIMBY issues. Basically. Right, exactly. My Not backyard. so much fracking. And, and as the, the professor pointed out, most of the seismic activity has been around these uh, waste wells and not necessarily around the active fracking uh, oil and gas sites. But you have seen a lot of news in the states that are affected. I mean, California has uh, already banned uh, several uh, waste wells, as did Arkansas, in direct response to what they confirmed was seismic activity as a result of those. Mm -hmm. the, the question is, is what the EPA is going to do about it, the Environmental Protection Agency. The GAO, an independent watchdog agency of the federal government, just released a study blasting the EPA for doing a terrible job in overseeing these waste wells. Now, there's more than 170,000 of these things scattered around the country, but there's been a huge increase in the use of them uh, as fracking has taken off because uh, fracking has really just boomed since 2008 or so and so we've seen a huge growth in the need to, do, to do, dispose of, do, of do. tens of millions of gallons of contaminated fluid. Is there an issue of best practices here? In other words, is there a way to frack and, and dispose of waste that doesn't produce these consequences or is this just built into the system? Uh, the, the direct impact is built into the system. If you're going to frack, you're going to frack. And if you're going to frack, you run the risk of causing uh, industry-induced seismicity. Uh, the waste disposal process, uh, as Tyson pointed out, there are regulations on the books for different types of waste injection wells. But when the EPA wrote the rules for type 2 injection wells that take waste and oil and gas, they did not include seismic investigations. Hmm. That's, so that's, they that's could very crazy. easily rewrite that regulation that says you may not inject waste into a well where you have done a seismic investigation and determined that there is a fault system that is likely to be impacted by that waste. From 2008 to 2013, the oil and gas industry created more jobs on net than all other industries combined. There's a reason the fastest growing job state over the past several years has been North Dakota, where the oil and gas boom is centered, thanks to the Bakken formation. And in Texas, the oil and gas industry growth has powered the state, thanks to the Eagle Ford and the Permian and Haynesville formations. As this chart from the U.S. Energy Information Administration shows, oil and gas industry employment has far outpaced job growth in any other area of the economy. And by the way, the wages in the oil and gas industry, they blow away wages in other industries. The average wages of oil and natural gas production jobs were $108,000 in 2013, double that of other industries. So why the boom? Well, thanks to the process known as fracking, in which water, chemicals, and sand are shot at shale formations unlocking natural gas, production has skyrocketed, 
even without creating new oil and natural gas rigs. At the start of 2012, America had about 1,300 oil and natural gas rigs and produced the equivalent of just under 8 million barrels of oil per day. Today, America still has 1,300 oil and natural gas rigs, and we produce the equivalent of 12 million barrels of oil per day. The United States is now the biggest energy producer on the planet. 